الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسانا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters, I would like to welcome you to another Tafsir lesson on Tuesday night, alhamdulillah, in the afternoon, here in the Masjid of Taqwa in the city of Sheffield. So alhamdulillah, as I always, or as I'm always saying to you, or as I always normally do tell you that alhamdulillah this day is, is kind of like my favorite day right now of the week. Mashallah, the day I come to Sheffield, the day I see mom, the day I see dad, the day I see brothers, the day I see Masjid Taqwa, the day I come and see all my brothers and sisters here, Mashallah. It's the day that we do the tafsir together. So it's uh, kind of like a beautiful day. I look forward to, as I'm coming to Sheffield, as I'm driving, you know, or on the train, Alhamdulillah. And because I know that I'm going to come and see my brothers, Mashallah, and, and my sisters, Mashallah, my community here in Sheffield. So, Jazakumullah Khairan for coming and always be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you the ability to come to the masjid. You know, there are so many other young people um, who are just like you. You know them very well, some of your cousins, your friends, your, your neighbors. They're not here with you right now and uh, maybe they're busy with other things. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability to come to the masjid to make part of your daily plan to come to the masjid and say, today's Tuesday, I'm going to be going to Masjid al-Taqwa, I'm going to be listening to the tafsir. And as you know, the Qur'an is a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a beautiful gift. And the Lord who created us, He's the one who sent us this message, mashallah. Very important message. And we are learning something new every day, mashallah, when we study the tafsir. This is the beauty of the Qur'an. Mashallah, every single day when you come, you learn something that you didn't know before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, teach you things that you didn't know before. So Alhamdulillah, which surah are we on right now? What's the surah we are, we have started last week? Surah Tuqad, Mujadila, mashallah. Surah Tuqad, say, Allah, qawla allati tujadiluka. And this surah, was it revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu when he was in Mecca or when he was in Medina? When he was in Medina. If the Quran that you are going through that time, let's say the surah that you are studying, and if it is a Medina surah, if it, was, uh, if it is a surah that was revealed to the Prophet when he was in Medina, what kind of topics should you expect? Rules and regulations, very good. Rules and regulations, very good. Also, what other topics should you expect? Hypocrites. The hypocrites, the monarchs will be talked about. And what other topics should you expect? The people of the? The people of the book. Okay, especially the Yahud will be talked about as well. Okay, very good. So, last week we have studied the first few ayat. And who's going to remind us the purpose of revealing these verses? What was the story behind it? What happened? Mashallah Musa. Well, like, Kaula. Kaula. Kaula, yes, Mashallah. Kaula, and there's her wife. Okay, Khawla was the wife and Aus was the husband. Okay, what happened? What did he say to her? He said, You are like my mother. Very good. He said to her, like, You are my mother to me. Okay, and was Allah happy with that statement? Allah wasn't happy with that statement. If a husband says to his wife, You are unlawful to me like my mother is unlawful to me. Okay, what did that mean in the past, like before, before Islam came? And what did the Arabs. And how do they used to translate that? If somebody says to his wife, if a husband says to his wife, you are unlawful to me as my mom, my mom is unlawful to me. What did they used to mean by that? Uh, a divorce. A divorce, Well done, mashallah. That meant for them, that was a divorce. And we mentioned the story of <coughs> Khawla, when her husband said that to her, and her interpretation was like, maybe you're divorced. And even her husband, Aus, and Ibn Samit, he felt like that as well. So, and uh, and then Khawla, she went. Where did she go to? Who did she go to? Yes, she went to the Prophet sallallahu Right now, what lesson can we learn from that? If if a situation comes and you and you don't know the Islamic ruling of it, before you do anything, you should go and ask a Sheikh, somebody who has knowledge of the Deen. Okay. So if you're not sure, 
is this okay or not okay? So Khawla right now, she didn't know. And, and her husband as well, they didn't know like, what was going on. So because now he said this statement, you are unlawful to me like my mother is unlawful to me. They didn't know what that meant. Did it mean like, does it mean the same thing as it meant before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran or not? When she went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did he know what to say, the Prophet sallam? He didn't know the meaning. Okay. Some of the narrations, some of the narrations have said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I can't find any way out for you. All I can tell you right now is, you are haram for him. Okay. He can't have any relationship with you. That's all I know right now. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran. Which house was the Prophet at that time? Who's, which wife was he with that moment? Aisha radiallahu very good. He was in the house of Aisha radiallahu Was Aisha able to hear everything that was being said between the Prophet and Khawla? Was she able to hear everything or she was able to hear some? She was able to hear some. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he has revealed the surah, what did he say? I have, I have heard. Qad sami' Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has heard everything that was said. Okay, nothing was hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The conversation that was happening, the dialogue, the, the, the back and forth conversation that was happening. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us. Okay, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِ إِلَى اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوَرَكُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهُ سَمِعُ مُصِيرُ Last week we also have studied, and what about if a man says like, you are like my aunt to me. Is that going to be the same? You are like my sister to me. Okay, so it is exactly the same thing. I'll tell you something. Um, if a husband says to his wife, um, my sister, you are my sister. What do you think? <laughs> ah, yeah. You should not say that to your wife, my sister. Your wife, she's not your sister. Okay, that's something new that you can learn. You can't say to your wife, like, my sister, how are you doing? Okay, she's not your sister. Okay, especially if you have the intention of like saying to her, if your intention is like, you are like my sister, so you shouldn't be saying that. Okay, but she's your sister in Islam, she's your sister in Islam. But if you say like my sister, because a companion has said to his wife, Ukhti, and the Prophet said to him like, what do you mean by that? Do you mean like, and he said no, I didn't mean that, she was like haram for me. Okay, so you have to be careful with that. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qad sami'a Allah qawla latin. Allah has heard the words of the woman who disputed with you, O Prophet, about her husband and complained to Allah. Allah has heard what you both had to say. He is all hearing, all seeing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears all and sees all as well. And what was the ruling that was revealed? If a man says to his wife, you are like my mother. Okay, is he able to be with her? or he has to do something before they go back together. He has, to do, he has to do... He has to do three things. One of three things. Well done. One of three things. He doesn't have to do all the three things. One of three things. What's the first one? He has to... Um, he, he has to... Uh, he has to fast for 60 days. That's one of them. Very good. So what's the order? What's the first one? So he has to do... Yes? He has to free a slave. Number one, he has to free a slave. Can we find a slave today? No. To free? No. Okay. So if he cannot find a slave to free right now, or he can't buy a slave, for example, it's too expensive, what is the next option? Yes. Someone else? Yes, what? To fast two consecutive months. To fast two consecutive months. What about if, it, if fasting? You know, if fasting is too hard, what would be the third? Okay, yes. Feeding 60 people. Feeding 60 people. Okay, when the Prophet ﷺ, when the ruling was revealed, and the Prophet ﷺ asked that companion to do one of those three, was the companion able to do any of the three? He wasn't able to do any of the three. He didn't have enough money to buy a slave. He, didn't, he wasn't able to fast two months. His wife said he has to eat two or three times a day, or drink two or three times a day, otherwise his health is going to just deteriorate. He wasn't able to fast two consecutive months. Okay, and when he was asked to feed 60 people, what did he say? We don't have enough to feed 60 people. And then the Prophet gave him something so he can actually feed other people. Can you see how, how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how beautiful our religion is? It gives you, mashallah, rulings for everything. Alhamdulillah, it, it teaches you how to live your life. 
Shah. Look, this particular companion, he said these, he said this particular statement in his house when he was by himself with his wife. And it was it was a private matter, okay? But it has a rule in Islam. Okay, so you should never think, oh, I can say things in private and do things in private, and that's it, I'll get away with it. You can't get away with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. For example, if a man says to his wife in the, within their own house, and he says to her, like, within the house, you are like my mother to me. And then later on he says, I've never said it. He's, 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 he's lying, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. And uh, it's haram for him to stay with that wife, unless he does one of them, three things. He cannot be intimate with her anymore, class. He has to do one of the three things. Okay? MashaAllah. And then at the end of those ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look how he, what he said. So this was the last ayah we recited last or uh, translated last week. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, but anyone who does not have the means, this is ayah number four. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, but anyone who does not have the means should fast continuously for two months before they touch each other, meaning before they become intimate with one another. Okay, the husband and wife before they sleep together. And anyone unable to do this should feed 60 needy people. 60 needy people. This is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tilka hududullah. This is so that you may truly have faith in Allah. Allah said, this is so that you may truly have faith in Allah and His Messenger. Can you see how faith and family matters, how they are related? Okay, Family issues and faith, they are both related. MashaAllah, what we believe and how we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu and also the family matters, they all linked. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ These are the limits set by Allah. So everyone has to live by those limits. As a believer, we have to live, we have to live within the limits of Allah. I'll tell you, I'll ask you, do you know a 200 meter runner, for example, or, a, or let's say a 400 meter runner, when you are running in the track, let's say you're in a competition, each person has got what? What do they have? A particular lane. If you get out of the lane, what happens? You will be disqualified. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us like um, limits. Allah is saying, this is how you need to, this is how you're supposed to live your life. I gave you the limits. Don't step outside of the line. Okay? Do not step step outside of this lane. Stay on that lane. As a Muslim, we have been given, mashallah, limits and, and parameters to live within, mashallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And then Allah said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, These are the bounds set by Allah. Grievous torment awaits those who ignore them. So if somebody doesn't live by these rules, what will happen? Allah will punish them in the next life. Look at the next ayah. This is the ayah we're starting from today. Ayah number five. This is a severe wound. Those who oppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Those who are, who have kind of like strong who are strong opposition to the Prophet Sallallahu and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala those who are against Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala very strongly Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said those who oppose Allah and His Messenger will be brought low low or they will be humiliated they will be humiliated okay they will be humiliated like those before them those who came before them and did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they went against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and his messenger, what happened to them? They were actually humiliated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have revealed clear messages, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. After that, an humiliating torment awaits those who ignore them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. After that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to say, يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِعًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِعًا On the day when Allah will raise everyone and make them aware of what they have done. That's the next life, the day of judgment. So everyone will be brought back to life and they will be told what they have done in this life. فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is it he has done? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has written down everything. Okay, أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوهُ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he did was, Allah has kept account of it. So whatever action that we do, whatever statements that we make, everything is written. And guess what? You cannot argue about it in the next life. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, that day what will be said to you is, this is your book and I want you to read it. I'll just give you an example. Right now, if you have a phone, mobile phone for example, and, and it's a contract. So at the end of the month, what do they send you? The itemized bill. Let's say sometimes you might say, I didn't use this amount of minutes. I haven't actually used this amount of money. This is too much. What will they send you? The itemized bill. And they will say to you, that minute, you have called and contacted this person. That minute you contact, and this is how long you have actually been talking. Everything is written in front of you. Can you can you deny that? You can't, because they will remind you all of this. But in the next life, every little thing that we've done in this life is already written down. If human beings can record, like how many days, how many minutes you used when you used your phone, for example, or even the cameras right now, you know the CCTV cameras that we have, we have, they can record our actions. Imagine Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and also the angels who are writing everything that we do, everything is recorded. In the past, maybe it would have been difficult for people to imagine how things can be recorded. But now, those of us who live today, we should, be, we should find it easy to understand this, the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recording everything. MashaAllah. Does that make sense? So everything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ahsan Allah wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually, has taken everything into account, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken account of it all. Everything was written. When soon, though they may have forgotten. As human beings, we forget. We are very forgetful. If somebody says to you, can you tell me what you did yesterday? You will forget. You will say, oh, I don't remember. Somebody, if someone asks you, what were you doing six days yesterday? You might say, hmm, I don't really remember what I was doing six o'clock. Six days in the afternoon, I don't know what I was doing. Can someone tell me like exactly what you were doing at six days? I can hardly remember it. It's very difficult for you to remember. That minute, if I said to you, 6.30 on the dot, what were you doing yesterday? You don't know. You can't remember. You might just have a vague idea. You might say, 6.30, I believe I was at home. I was watching TV, maybe. 6.30, maybe I was playing football. That's all you can say. But if somebody says to you, 6.30 on the dot, what were you doing at that particular second? Can you remember it? No. It's difficult. Okay? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have record of everything. Allah said, you guys will forget, but I, have, I will not forget because everything is written down. Okay, well, so, Wallahu ala kulli shayin shaheed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, He witnesses everything. He, he witnesses everything. So every action that we do, everything that we say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala witnesses it. And we can never hide it from Him. Everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of. Look at the next ayah. The next ayah is quite similar. Alam tara anna Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet, Alam tara anna Allah. Do you not see, O oh Prophet Muhammad, do you not see that Allah knows everything in the heavens and earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of everything. Everything that happens in the heavens and everything that happens on this earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. What concept is this? The concept of Tawheed. Knowing that the names and attributes of Allah. Okay? Whenever you hear Allah knows, whenever you hear Allah sees, whenever you hear Allah, uh, Allah hears, you should remember this is this concept is tawheed, it's about aqidah. Okay? And it should build your iman. Okay, when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything, you know you cannot really do bad stuff. Because you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now Allah tells us some specific stuff. Allah said, there is no secret conversation that happens between three people except Allah is the fourth. If three people get together and they plot something against other people, who is the fourth and is aware of it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if three people get together and they have like a secret conversation, I am the fourth. Does that mean Allah is physically with them or he is with them by his knowledge? Which one? He's physically there with them or he's there by his knowledge? By his knowledge. But where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Above that? Above his throne. Does Allah need his throne to sit on? No. So you have to remember these are very important points of Tawheed. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his throne, but he doesn't need to sit on the throne. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if three people get together 
and they actually um, have secret conversation that the rest of us are not aware. What, what did Allah say? I am the fourth one, I know it. Okay, I am with you guys. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued. مَا يَكُونُ مِنْ نَكْوَ ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ If five people get together, he's number six. Uh, I'll just bring, I'll just give you an example. You know sometimes people who work in the same company or in the same organization, we have normally like weekly meetings, yeah? Everybody gets together. We have a meeting. After that meeting finishes, a meeting like consulting one another and benefiting from one another, when the meeting finishes, like three or four, every group, like you have groups within the bigger meetings, like, those guys will get together and say, you know what, I wasn't really happy with what the manager was saying. And then they have their own little conversation and they start backbiting everybody and say like, you know, you know what, such a such was saying, I wasn't happy with that. That stuff, who's aware of it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, I say to you, your secret meetings after the big meeting, I'm aware of it. So be aware of that. You know, sometimes when you are together with other people, and when some people leave, other people kind of like have secret conversations behind their backs. Or in the car park, after the meeting, meeting finishes, three or four of you will stand outside in the car park, and then you will say, okay, what did you think of the meeting? This is what I thought of the meeting. And, and what, what, should we, what should we say in the next meeting? And then you have your own plan and plots. Okay? What's happening there? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you, I am aware of it. If four of you get together, I'm the fifth. If three of you get together, I'm the fourth. If six of you get together, I am the seventh. If hundred of you get together, I'm the one hundred and the first. I'm there. You can never hide anything from me. So this is a very important uh, point. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, also, even if you are less than that or more, it doesn't matter. I am, I'm aware of everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, wherever you are, wherever you are. You know the meetings that happen in the White House, number 10 down the street, everything. You know the corporate meeting, sometimes they say the security meeting. All of those meetings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. You know President Putin right now, the meetings that he has his generals, everything, and his ministers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of it. Nothing is hidden from Allah. Do you know uh, the powerful people, the elite, the, the big business people, the people who are always trying to find out how they can exploit from other people, how they can exploit people and make money from, their, uh, from, from them. Okay? Almost Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of all of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And He will inform them of what they did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inform us of what we did. Everybody of us, whatever we did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell us. ثُمَّ يُنَبِّهُمْ بِمَا عَمْلُوا And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's, he's the one who's aware of everything. He knows, he's the knower of everything. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Why did Allah end this ayah with the name Alim? Because he wants to tell us that he's, he's the knower of everything. He knows everything. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ So we should never, we should never ever think that we are able to hide things from Allah. You can hide things from authority. Okay, sometimes you might delete your, you know, some messages, sometimes you delete messages, so nobody else can read it. You know, even human beings right now, if you delete, humans have reached the level where you can actually, with the technology, if you delete certain messages, the police can get it. They can retrieve it. And these are just human beings. What about Allah? Can you delete anything? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't be able to find out. Okay? If human beings are able to get the, the, the messages that you deleted, what about Allah? Are you able to hide anything from Allah? You can't hide anything from Allah. So remember that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah bi kulli shayin alayhi. Allah is aware of it. We can, we can delete things from our, and our parents won't see it. Our managers won't see it. Our friends won't see it. We can have passwords for everything. But what? Can, can, you, can you actually lock up lock your phone and use like a very hard password, okay? And, and keep it secret from the angels that are writing your actions. You can't hide that from you. SubhanAllah. So always remember, in Allah Allah SWT, He's aware of everything. Every single thing that you do. Okay? Everything you write, everything you read, everything you watch, everything you listen, Allah SWT is aware of it. In Allah Bikulli Shayin Ali. And now Allah SWT is going to talk about a particular group of people. 
ألم تر إلى الذين نهوا عن الندوة ثم يعودون لما نهوا عنه ويتناجون بالإسم الله سبحانه وتعالى said have you not seen how those who have been forbidden to hold secret conversations go back afterwards and hold them some of the ulama they said these people are the munafiks the munafikin what did they used to do they used to come to the study circle when the Prophet used to teach or they used to come to the masjid and pray with the Prophet and they used to listen to his khutbah they used to listen to the the teachings of the Prophet but after they leave they used to have their own meetings and they used to say okay how can we undermine the Prophet how can we let him down okay how can we harm the Muslims that's that's the kind of secret meetings that they used to have so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said have you not seen how those who have been forbidden to hold secret conversations go back afterwards and hold them they will do the same thing even though they were told guys we can't hold meetings, okay? Secret meetings. They will do it again. They will go back and actually do the meeting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exposed them. أَلَمْ تَرَيْ إِلَى الَّذِينَ نُهُوا عَنْ نَجْوَى ثُمَّ يَعُودُونَ لِمَا نُهُوا عَنْ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said وَيَتَنَاجَوْنَ بِالْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And what do they do? They conspire with one another in what is sinful. So they always used to plot against the Prophet's lives. Also it was said, this ayah was revealed and it is talking about the Yehud, the Yehud of Medina. You know, the Jewish um, tribes that used to live in Medina. Imagine the Prophet, the companions of the Prophet, some of them, when they find themselves in an area where the Yehud used to live, and they are walking on that particular street, when the Yehud sees like a, a group of the Yehudi, for example, people, when they see some of the companions walking in the street, or an individual from the companions walking in the street, they used to kind of like, they used to hold secret conversation among themselves to put some sort of doubt into the head of the companion. Thinking like, wow, just imagine now you are walking in the street and there are a group of people who are standing at the bottom of the road and then as soon as they saw you coming and approaching, they kind of like get together and they kind of like start talking, whispering to one another. You don't know, you will, especially if you know that these people are your enemies, you will think that they are plotting against you and they want to harm you. So you, you will come a bit scared. And you might actually t take a different turn. You might take a U-turn, you might take a, a right turn, a left turn, and go back. Because you are worried that they might harm you. So this is what they used to do, the Yahud. The areas the way they used to live, if a believer comes and walks through that area, this is the kind of action that they used to do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exposing them. أَلَمْ تَرَيْ إِلَى الَّذِينَ نُهُوا عَنِ النَّدْوَى ثُمَّ يَعُودُونَ بِمَا نُهُوا عَنْهُ وَيَتَنَادُونَ بِالْإِثْمُ وَالْإِدْوَانِ وَمَعْصِيَةِ الرَّسُولِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, they used to conspire with one another in what is sinful and also hostile. They used to be hostile to the believers. And the munafiks themselves, they used to be like that. They used to be hostile as well. And hostile. And disobedient to the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَيَتَنَجُونَ بِالْإِثْمُ الْعُدَانِ مَحْسِيَةُ الرَّسُولِ وَإِذَا جَاءُوكَ And when they come to you, حَيَّوكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهِ When they come to you, they greet you with a greeting wherewith Allah greets you not. So, they used to use a different greeting when they greeted the Prophet ﷺ. And I'll give you this example. One day, the Prophet ﷺ was with his wife Aisha. And he was, he was with her and probably he was sitting outside his house. And uh, a man from the Yahud was walking past. And what did he say to the Prophet ﷺ? He said to the Prophet, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Aisha anha, she, she became very upset. And then she has returned his greeting with another greeting which was what? Which was kind of like more severe. She said to him, May Sam be upon you, you are Ikhwan al karada You are the brothers of the monkeys. She kind of like swore to him. She swore to him a bit more. So the Prophet said to Aisha, calm down Aisha. Why did, you, why did you need to do that? And then Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, did you not hear what he just said to you? He said to you, As-salamu alaykum. And the Prophet said that, I have, I have returned the salam that he gave me, and I said to him, Wa alaykum, may the same be upon you. Look at the Prophet he did not transgress. He didn't swore at him or anything like that. The man has said to him, As-salamu alaykum. And the Prophet said to him, Wa alaykum. May that be upon you as well. 
The question is, what is Assam Ali? Assam Ali is actually a curse. So he was like saying, may death be upon you. So he didn't say Assalam fully, he said Assam Ali. Assam Ali means may death be upon you. So he actually cursed the Prophet and he made dua against the Prophet. And Aisha was very upset. She has heard that and she said, Ya Rasulullah, did you not just hear what he said to you? And the Prophet said, I've heard what he said to me, and all I did was like, may the same be upon you, that's it. I said, wa well, I didn't actually do anything extra. I didn't kind of like, took it further. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exposing them here. He said, وَإِذَا جَاءُكَ حَيُّكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهِ And what did they used to say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is also going to reveal to us something that they used to say to themselves. This is the inner, inner conversation that used to take place within themselves. What did they used to say? They used to say, if what we are saying is wrong, why Allah is not punishing us? Can you see this? They used to say, وَإِذَا جَاءُكَ حَيَّوْكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهِ وَيَقُولُونَ فِي أَنفُسِهِ They used to say to themselves, لَوْ لَا يُعَذِّبُنَ اللَّهُ بِمَا نَقُولُ they, they, they said, if what we are doing is wrong, Allah would have punished us for this. But since he's not punishing us, what we are doing is okay. Ah, what about the kuffar of today? This is some, some of them, or many of them, this is how we think. They would probably think like, if what I am doing is, is bad, and if there was God who was going to punish me, he would have punished me for it anyway. But he's not, he's not punishing me for it now, so either what I'm doing is not bad, or he's not even there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, these people, what do they say to themselves? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is what they say to themselves inwardly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and, and say inwardly, why does Allah not punish us for what we say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then said, Hasbuhum jahannam. Hell will be punishment enough for them, they will burn their an evil destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hasbuhum jahannam yaslawnaha, or bi'sal masih. That's the worst place to go back to. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he told us that, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers the message to us as Muslims, as believers. Ya ayyuhal ladina amin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Now we need to open our ears and say, oh, what's Allah going to say to me now? Because Allah is addressing the believers right now. We are the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal ladina amin. Ida tanajit. Allah said, oh you who believe, when you converse in secret, do not do so in a way that is sinful. As believers, we can have secret conversations, but we must make sure what we are going to talk about in our secret conversation must not be something which is hard. Okay, let's say Brother Masoor, Brother Mahat, Brother Mustafa, Brother Amar, they can have a secret meeting, but they can have a positive meeting. And where they talk about something, with how can we do khayr, how can we increase, let's say, the ibadah that we do, how can we get more students or more brothers to the mystery, okay, they can have this kind of discussion, okay, and have a secret meeting, okay, and say, how can we encourage more brothers and more sisters to come to the masjid, how can we, mashallah, work harder and be better Muslims, okay, you can do that, okay, there's no, no problem, and um, so Allah said, if you are going to have a secret conversation, make sure that it is not a haram, okay, make it haram, okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, oh you who believe, when you converse in secret, do not do in a so in a way that is sinful, hostile as well, which is hostile, and disobedient to the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do it in a way that is good and mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can have secret conversation where you are discussing about good stuff. Okay, how we can improve ourselves, how, how we can be better Muslims, how we can help other people become better Muslims, and so forth. You can talk about something positive. Or how can we organize, let's say, activities for the youth. It doesn't have to be just about Quran and Hadith, no. It can be good activities. Imagine Yasin and Yusuf and other brothers getting together and say, how can we organize a good trip for the young people, like from the masjid, and so forth. So these kind of meetings, they are good ones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with those ones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتَنَاجُوا بِالْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ And then Allah said, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي إِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ Be mindful of Allah to whom you will be gathered. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always is reminding us about taqwa, being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear Allah, fear Allah, fear Allah. Okay? Always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, inna man nadwa min ash shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, secret conversation is the work of shaitan. Secret conversation, conversation is the work of shaitan. And why did he, what, how did he design it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ مَنْ نَجْوَىٰ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Why is he doing this? Designed to cause trouble to the believers. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said about having secret conversations. إِنَّ مَنْ نَجْوَىٰ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ And any other, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, secret counsels, conspiracies, are only from shaitan. In order that he may cause grief to the disbelievers, to, to the believers. إِنَّ مَنْ نَدْوَى مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ لِيَحْزُنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَيْسَ بِضَارِهِمْ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, though it cannot harm them in the least unless Allah permits. So if people get together right now to harm the Muslims, they can't do that unless Allah allows it. You know, the enemies of Muslims and Islam, if they get together and have their secret meetings and plot against the Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, they won't be able to harm you unless Allah allows it. وَلَيْسَ بِضَارِقِهِمْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And then Allah said, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, let the believers put their trust in Allah. So we have to put our trust in Allah. If you put your trust in Allah, no one can really harm you. Okay? And you know, whatever somebody does to you that's not good, remember that's something that Allah has permitted. And it's khayr for you as well. It's not going to be bad and evil for you. So inshallah ta'ala, this is where we are going to stop for the day. And next week, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be starting from the next ayah. And but before we finish, as usual, we're going to answer the questions. Your questions from last week. The first question. Are you ready for the questions? The questions are quite exciting. Okay. The first question is, what is the difference between vihar and normal divorce? This is a very important. What's the difference between vihar what was the concept that Allah talked about at the beginning of the surah? A man to say, what's vihar? Vihar is a man's statement where he says to his wife, you are like my mother. You are to me like my mother. What's the difference between that and the normal divorce? That's a very important question. Maybe some of you had this question in your head last week, but you didn't ask me. But now, mashallah, one of the brothers, Jazakallah khair, he has asked me that question. He said, what is the difference between the normal divorce and this particular vihar, this act? Number one, vihar, vihar is a haram act. It's haram. You can't do vihar. Islamically, it's not allowed. But talaq, divorce is allowed. A husband can divorce his wife. So that's one major difference. Vihar is an act which is not halal. Okay, it's haram. But once you do it, Allah gives you the way out. You have been given a way out of it. So that's number one. And number two, vihar is not like a normal divorce. Okay? If a man says to his wife, you are divorced, she's divorced from him. How many, how many divorces a man has the right to divorce his wife? He has three divorces. He can divorce his wife once and then take her back. He can divorce her a second time and then he can take her back. How many divorces has he done so far? Two. If he divorces her the third time, he can't take her back. Until she gets married to another man and then that man divorces her. And then she becomes available for marriage. That time he can go back to her. And when he goes back to her this time, he has to remarry her. Does that make sense? Okay. But vihar, there aren't any specific number of vihar that someone can do. So a man might fall into that sin, the sin where he says to his wife, the statement where he says to his wife, you are like my mother to me. So he's done it today. So right now if he's done that, what does he have to do? If he wants to go back to his wife, what does he need to do? One of the... One of the three things. So he has to do one of the three things. So when he does one of the three things, what will happen? He will be able to be with her. Okay. Imagine after two days he did the same thing. 
He's got money, so he says to Biha, you are like my mother to me. It's very, whenever he gets upset with her, he says that. So he's got a lot of money, so he feeds 60 people. And then after one week, he forgets himself. He does the same thing. You are like, oh, and then, oh, they have to pay six, feed 60 people. He, he does it again. So we're not going to say to him, like, oh, you run out of it. Because now you've done it three times, four times. No. So you can, so, but he's falling into a sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this is a sin. Okay? So that's the, so when it comes to divorce, divorce, the man has the right to divorce his wife, but he only has three chances while he's, when he's able to divorce his wife. And if it's more than that, if he, if he divorces three times, he can't go back there until she gets married to somebody else. Is that, is that answer clear? Mashallah, so you can see the difference. Okay, another question is this. Is it haram to wear false nails on your female cycle? Okay, so this is a question from the sisters. Can a female wear uh, kind of like uh, fake nails, for example, false um, uh, nails? Um, according to some of the ulama, it is allowed. It's allowed to wear to wear them, but make sure when the sister is um, uh, making wudu that she takes them off because the water has to touch the normal nails. So it's important that it's taken off. Excellent. The next question is, last week one of the things that we mentioned was and many of the ulama, they used to be former slaves or their, four, their fathers used to be slaves and they were set free and after that they became ulama. So someone said, if one of the ways, if, if like some of the ulama became like it, so if some of the ulama were originally um, slaves, or their fathers were like slaves, wasn't that a way of cheating your way out of getting your freedom? For example, someone was captured as a non-Muslim, and then he knows that uh, if he becomes a Muslim, and he would be he would be kind of like freed, for example. And if he does that, and then later on he doesn't really mean it, he doesn't want to become Muslim um, from his heart, but he was just cheating. Wouldn't people do that kind of stuff? Wouldn't people like act as gay Muslims? And then once they get their freedom, they will go back and, or they will not be true believers. That, that's possible, yes, it could have happened. But Alhamdulillah, when the kuffar who were captured in the battlefield, when they saw the Muslims and how the Muslims were, mashallah, conducting themselves and how, how Islam has changed them, many of them, Alhamdulillah, they became true believers and true Muslims and they didn't need to actually fake it or anything like that. Okay, next question. Should you play card games in the masjid? Uh. Ah. <laughs> okay, can we play card games in the masjid? What did Allah say? The masjid, they have been built for what reason? For worship. Okay, the question is, what is worship? Worship is anything that Allah, ismun jama'un li kulli man Allah Worship is anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes. Okay, whether that's an act, whether that is a statement, whether that's something which is hidden or something which is apparent. So, if we look at card games, what benefit do they have? Can we, can we say that they are an act of worship? Someone might say they have some sort of benefit. It brings people together. Kind of like, it's so, it helps people to socialize, to get together. It kind of like helps them to have like a sharpness in their uh, thinking and it helps you to be a better thinker and, and, and a good game player and so forth. Uh, so these are some sort of benefits. Um, but can we play card games in the mystery? So even, for example, if someone is in the mystery and let's say they're not in the main hall, they're kind of like upstairs in one of the rooms and, uh, and there's nobody standing there, it's quiet, empty, and they're in the mystery and they don't want to leave because they, they were worried that they might actually miss the Salah, the next Salah. And so instead of going outside and doing some stuff, they thought, okay, let's play a game here in the masjid upstairs, for example, in one of the rooms. Inshallah ta'ala, that is going to be okay. But it should not be something that we kind of like regularly say, oh, let us meet in the masjid and play card game. Okay, so it's like every now and then it should be okay. Okay, sometimes we are allowed to play 
And also, alhamdulillah, we have a leisure room in our masjid, masjid of taqwa outside. That's where you should be coming, and inshallah ta'ala benefiting from that facility there, inshallah. So, okay, is that clear? Okay, that's inshallah ta'ala. The next question, if you commit shirk, can you make it up by praying? Okay, very good question. If somebody commits shirk, what is shirk? That's the first question. Shirk is associating partners with Allah. That's what shirk is. Shirk is of two types. One is a minor shirk, the other one is a major shirk. What is the difference between major shirk and minor shirk? Minor shirk. Major shirk, tell us. A minor shirk is like when it's not that big, but like a major shirk is like when it's like very big. Absolutely, you're right, yes. The major one is the one that takes you out of Islam. For example, if someone prostrates to idol, to an idol for example, or if someone slaughters an animal for an idol, or if someone prays to someone other than Allah. So that's a major one. Okay, that person is not a believer. He will leave the fold of Islam. What is the minor one? Minor shirk is like showing off. Show off. You were praying salah, for example, look, you pray your salah, and then you were praying quite quickly. So you were in the masjid by yourself, and you go like this, Allah, 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 And then somebody walked, your parents walked into the room, and now you go like, the second raka is much better than the first raka. Okay, now, now what you're doing, you're doing show off. Okay, so, so that part of your salah is going to go missing. Okay, you're not going to get edged for that sad part because you were showing off. So this is called minor. Or you do good things, not for the sake of Allah, but for the sake of the people. You just want to be praised by the people. You come to the masjid, you come to the lessons, you just want to be praised by the people. You don't want anything from Allah. You just do it for the people. So that time, that's a minor shirk. So the question is, can you make it up by praying? Okay, how do you make up, uh, for example, for the shirk that you have committed? By making tawbah, tawbah, repentance. You repent back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it was a major shirk, you make repentance to Allah. And what is repentance? Repentance has got three conditions. You stop doing what you were doing. Number two, you regret that you've done it. And number three is you decide you're not going to go back to it. If you fulfill those three conditions, your tawbah is going to be accepted. The same thing for showing off. If you do those three things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your tawbah and the sin of shirk will be wiped away from your record. It will be wiped away from your record. Okay, the next one. Ah. Electronic cigarettes. Are they halal or haram? The vapes. Islamically, they are haram. They still have harm. Okay? So, there's still harm there, and as long as there's harm there, it will remain harm. So, and also remember, this will lead to a bigger sin. So, if somebody starts using electronics and this and that, shaitan sometimes will trick you and say to you, don't smoke normal cigarettes. Just use like the other one. This is a bit healthier. This is a bit less dangerous than the other one. Okay, this is a bit more acceptable. You can do it like uh, you can use it in public uh, places and so forth. Use this one. If you think like that and Shaitan tricks you like that, what will happen later on? You just go to go and use the normal cigarettes later on, and even something worse than that. So you must stay away from this kind of stuff. Okay. So, mashallah, those are uh, the questions, alhamdulillah, that have been asked uh, last week. Okay, inshallah, if you've got any questions, you can write them down in the left. Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.